Independence Day. So that's what you would like to be independent from. What are the things that weigh down on the mind, oppress the mind? If you ask most people, they'll talk about things outside. But if you look deeply in your own mind, you realize that the main burdens on the mind are things that come from within. This is why the mind needs to be trained. If the mind isn't trained, it just keeps on creating suffering for itself without realizing what it's doing. That phrase in the chant we chanted just now, those who don't discern suffering, on the surface sounds very strange. Everybody knows suffering. We've all suffered in one way or another in our lives. But the issue is, do we really discern it? Do we really understand it? Do we see precisely what's happening? If we could look into the way that the mind is creating suffering for itself, to the point where we really understand it, we take it apart, then that's the end. That's what comprehension means, as the Buddha once said. Our duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. In other words, understanding to the point where you stop creating it, where you can let it go. All the causes, all the conditions that lead to it, you can let them go. And the ones that you're responsible for just disband totally. As for the rest of the world outside, it goes along on its own way. But it doesn't make inroads in the mind. It can't weigh the mind down. Those are the good benefits of learning to understand or learning to discern suffering. But for most of us, our lives are distracted with other things, other issues that seem to be more impressing, and they make themselves more pressing. And it requires a real act of will to step outside of those requirements, those responsibilities. And to take the time to really look in, into the mind to see exactly where the suffering, what the suffering is, where it's coming from, and how it can be stopped. The Buddha once said, all he taught was suffering and the end of suffering. In other words, how to understand it to the point where you put an end to it. That's the essence of the teaching. Once that was accomplished, he said, well, that's all he really had to teach you. From that point on, you were truly independent. In the text, they describe stages in understanding suffering, stages of awakening. Total freedom is called arahantship. It means you become someone who is worthy, in other words, worthy of respect. The first stage, on the way, is called stream entry. You enter the stream to nirvana, the stream to true peace. The meaning of the image is that once you reach that point, then it's inevitable, just like Getting into a river, if you stay with the river, it will carry you down to the ocean, for sure. In this case, the ocean stands for nirvana. So it's important to reflect on the conditions that the Buddha said lead to that first stage of insight. The first is having good friends and other people, in other words, people who understand People who have discerned suffering have come to an understanding of it. Not only that, who lead their lives in such a way that's in line with the fact that they really have understood it. Because you find that the people you hang around are the ones who shape your own behavior, your own attitudes. Even if you're simply reacting against them, the, the way they think has a molding effect on your own thoughts. So you have to be careful who you hang around with. This is the, what we might call the social side of the practice. And then you listen to the Dharma from them. In other words, you really listen. And the Buddha gives instructions on how to know what is Dharma and what's not. And the test is putting into practice. 
But before you get there, first you have to think about it. You have to ask questions. This is what's radical about the Buddhist teachings, that the emphasis that's placed on asking questions, framing the right question. He calls it appropriate attention, paying attention to the right issues. In other words, the issues related to the end of suffering and precisely what your mind is doing to create suffering. Because our tendency is so often to go off and focus on this person, that person, not liking what this person's doing, not liking what that person's doing, getting upset, getting offended. And running off in that direction without looking at what the mind itself is doing. So the first questions are looking inside. If you put a particular teaching into practice, what results do you get? Do you find more passion, more aversion in your life or less? Do you find that you're more burdensome to yourself and other people or less? And then as you work through these questions and test the Dharma that you've listened, listened to, you get a better and better sense of how to practice in the Dharma in line with what the Dharma really is, the Dharma here being the truth, the truth that leads to the end of suffering. When you hear about these factors, there are four of them, associating with good people, listening to the Dharma, appropriate attention, and practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. It sounds like a one, two, three, four process, but it's not really. All four factors influence each other. In other words, as you put the Dharma into practice, that is not only a test of the Dharma you've heard, but also a test of the people you've been li listening to. You test their, whether they really are the good people you thought they were. So these things are all connected. And all four factors help refine each other as you practice, refine one another as you practice. And the Buddha said of the external factors, the most important one is associating with good people. That the internal factor is that factor of appropriate attention, learning to ask yourself the right questions, questioning your attitudes, questioning the results you're getting from your actions. And even though we may be sitting here with our eyes closed, we're not, we don't blind ourselves. We don't close our eyes to what's going on in our lives. In other words, we close our, our eyes so we can really look more carefully, more fully at the mind. So you can ask yourself directly, what are you doing right now? And what are the results of what you're doing? Are they satisfactory? So many people go through life habitually. They develop a habit and stick with that habit. And they get more and more and more ingrained in certain ways of doing things. That's basically the, the definition of addiction, people trying to put an end to suffering that they feel, and, and not really quite getting there, but continuing to repeat the same old actions over and over and over again. And where the habits have that old familiar, familiar, familiarity, it's like an old shoe that you're comfortable wearing. It may not be a particularly good shoe, but you're comfortable with it. we're practicing is learning how to ask the kind of questions that break out of the old mold, break out of the old habits, break our old addictions, our ways of doing things that really haven't gotten the ideal results, things that we've learned how to settle for second best, sometimes not even second best, third or fourth. But each time you sit down to meditate, remind yourself, what are you here for? You want real happiness. Well, have you found it? Well, no. Well, if not, then what, do you, what can you do to change what you're doing? It's this ability to keep asking that question and to be try new things. That's what appropriate attention is all about. So you can really find what it means to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. They say that this is one of Ajahn Mun's most frequent topics in Dharma talks. In other words, we practice the Dharma not in line with our preconceived notions, not in line with whatever our, our cultural background may be, 
or our own personal idea, well, I'm the sort of person who does these things this way, so it's going to have to go this way. We, you learn how to drop those things to find out, well, what is the actual Dharma? What is the practice of the true Dharma? And then you bring your own actions, your own thoughts, your own words, your deeds, your own attitudes in line with that. It requires a fair amount of sacrifice, a fair amount of letting go. So many old ways we have of doing things that we've learned how to, we've got to learn how to put aside. But when we're willing to put them aside, we find that things open up in the mind. If it weren't possible to change, there would be no reason to teach the Dharma. The Buddha wouldn't wouldn't have had to waste his time. But because he saw that it can make a difference, people can change their ways of living ways of thinking, ways of acting and speaking for the better, when they learn how to ask the right questions. And particularly looking at the issue of suffering in terms of cause and effect, exactly what goes along with the suffering. They use the word samudhya, which means origination, but it also means something that arises together. Every time there's suffering, what else is there in the mind? When the suffering goes away, what is gone? When it comes back again, what's come back again? You want to learn how to look at this, which requires good, strong concentration, steady mindfulness, which is why we, we work on these qualities in the, med the meditation. It also requires a sense of, of well-being in the present moment, so you're not desperate, you're not either grasping at straws or pushing things away out of irritation.